oil prices have jumped 2.5% after new conflict broke out in the Middle East. The US dollar strengthened overnight as traders continued to digest rate cut signals out of Jackson Hole, and New Zealand's government rushes to try and reduce energy prices. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ's chief economist for Southeast Asia and India, Sanjay Mathu, explains why Vietnam is not the only winner from the friendshoring trend, which is pulling parts of supply chains out of China. It does seem that all the stars are aligned for Malaysia to attract investment in the electronic sector. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, the price of Brent crude rose 2.5% overnight to above $80 a barrel after an Israeli strike in Lebanon. The S&P 500 was down 0.3% at 4am Sydney Melbourne time. Meanwhile, markets continued to digest signals out of the Jackson Hole Symposium with US Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's comments that now is the time for US rate cuts being contrasted against less dovish comments from other central bankers. ANZ Head of FX Research Marjorie Bean Zaman says there's potential for that to turn around now as the focus goes back to economies' respective growth outlooks. Clearly, a Fed easing is now reflecting in the way we have seen the US dollar sell off. But then when we look at the US accept growth exceptionalism, you could argue given the recent data in Europe, particularly looking at the activity data, the PMIs, the European growth story isn't looking great. When you look at the China growth story, again, it looks a little bit challenged. So it does look like some of this weakness in the USD is a little bit extended. As of 4am Sydney Melbourne time, the US dollar index was up 0.09%. The Aussie dollar trading down 0.19% at 67.78 US cents, while the Kiwi was down 0.34% at 62 0.11 US cents. Number two, the British pound was one of the currencies that jumped against the US dollar. It continues to hover near new year-to-date highs set last week of over 1.32 US dollars to the pound. Marjorie says the rally was based on bets the Federal Reserve will ease rates faster than the Bank of England. This was again on the back of the fact that Governor Bailey, who spoke at Jackson Hole, was a little cautious on the pace of monetary policy easing, saying that it was too early to declare victory. And of course, he came across less dovish versus chair power. So clearly this on the margin supported the sterling rally. Number three, rising power prices. They've been a feature in Australia in recent years, and now electricity shortages and huge wholesale price spikes have come to New Zealand. Last night, the government announced urgent measures to find more gas and run down already low hydro lakes after a series of big factory closures. Here's ANZ New Zealand's chief economist, Sharon Zollner, to explain. The wholesale electricity price in New Zealand has been subject to a bit of a perfect storm recently. The wind hasn't been blowing, the sun hasn't necessarily been shining on the right places, it certainly hasn't been raining enough in the right places to fill up the hydro lakes. That all conspired to see a huge spike in the wholesale electricity price in this last week from around $40 a kilowatt up to uh, well over 80 so it doubled. It's come right back. Nonetheless, it's been trending up for some time and it's quite problematic for large large electricity users in New Zealand. And we have seen some wood processors suggest uh, that they are actually going to cease operations in New Zealand because of these high energy costs. Number four. Sharon says there's a risk the spike in power prices turns into a double whammy for the economy of higher inflation and lower production. Most household and small business customers are protected for now because their retailers hedged at lower prices. But those hedges can only last for so long. Returning to normal will require more wind and rain, she says. If these prices stay high, we'll have to eventually feed through. So there's a little bit of a window, but we need a bit more luck with the weather than we've had. And you really just don't want to be in a position as a country where your energy security relies on luck. Number five, the Singapore dollar has surged by more than a cent to a 10-year high of one US dollar buying $1.29.99 Singaporean dollars in the last 24 hours. Last night, I spoke with ANZ head of Asia Research, Kun Go, from Singapore to find out more. This was largely driven by dollar weakness following Fed Chair Powell's uh, speech at Jackson Hole where he very clearly signaled that the Fed is uh, about to cut rates. Now on top of that, the Singapore dollar has also been uh, benefiting from the MES's strong dollar policy. The MES has an appreciation bias of the Singapore dollar in order to help contain inflation. So a combination of that plus prospects for Fed easing, weakening the dollar, has contributed to the strengthening in the Sing dollar. Couldn't go there. Now, in our bonus deep dive interview, 
ANZ's chief economist for Southeast Asia and India, Sanjay Mathu, has taken a closer look at Malaysia's growth prospects from friendshoring and electronics exports. Vietnam has not been the only winner, he says. And I asked Sanjay why Malaysia was benefiting from deglobalization of supply chains that were once totally based in China. The story with Malaysia really goes back to its historical development. So right from the 90s, this was an area, particularly in Penang and Ipoh, there was a lot of focus on developing the electronics industry. So there is a ready ecosystem that is already prevailing in Malaysia. Plus, it also has excellent infrastructure, particularly for an economy of its per capita income. The infrastructure is very, very good. So these factors, along with, and lastly, it also also has a reasonably skilled labor force that would also come into question later on. But at this point in time, it does seem that all the stars are aligned for Malaysia to attract investment in the electronic sector. And does it have capacity in terms of the skills and also the places to build factories and support from other infrastructure? The physical infrastructure, there's absolutely no doubt that it is one of the best in Asia. On the human resources angle, for the current technology or investment that's coming in, the situation appears quite adequate. But nonetheless, if Malaysia has to move up the supply chain in terms of value add, then I think they have to invest a lot more in developing the human resources in this area. And how about the relationship with Singapore, which obviously is a real a base for investment in electronics? Is there a chance that Malaysia and Singapore could work together to get some of this investment? Absolutely. So there is right across the border, there is a focus on developing a free trade zone, an industrial park in the state of Johor. And this should sort of really start fructifying with all the policy issues being sorted out by the end of this year. And that could see the development of Johor as an electronics hub. That would be a new hub for Malaysia and that would move away from Penang. And how important is this for Malaysia's economy overall? Does it have the ability to move the dial for its economic growth rate? I think so. And there are two things we are already seeing. One, Malaysia's investment to GDP ratio was coming down for several years. And finally, we are starting to see a reversal. Second, what we are seeing is that Malaysia's share in global electronics has generally been rising over the last five years. Thirdly, government policy vis-a-vis AI, etc. seem to be in the right place at this point in time. So we do think it can move the dial for Malaysia quite substantially. And in terms of unemployment and inflation, is there any danger that it would significantly increase wage rates or stress the um, the infrastructure and resources in a way that would create inflation? I wouldn't necessarily think that it has an impact on inflation, but certainly if we start to see better quality of jobs, then that automatically lead to better wage growth, more productivity. And in the end, that really means that Malaysia's TFP growth in terms of its long-term potential growth, all these would stand to benefit. Sanjay Martha there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Tuesday, August the 27th. Catch you tomorrow with a look ahead to key Australian inflation figures. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.